Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. How would you define the word manhood? Well, I hope that I shed some light on that in this video. I'd like to talk to you about how that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Jehovah of the Old Testament and the Creator of the universe, when He designed the order of everything, uh, prepared the way for Himself to become man in order to die as man, that we who had lost true manhood might live. God, who declares Himself to be altogether gracious in all of His intentions toward us, uh, is also supremely sovereign. If you watch this channel, you know that, that I believe that. And to me, that explains how such an evil could have been allowed to occur in the garden uh, that brought so, such an avalanche of tears to a race conceived in love by a Creator who desires only the best for His creatures was the fall and its penalty unforeseen? No. Was it an accident? Well, no. Was it merely allowed or was it planned? I suggest it was planned. It seems to me that it was both allowed and therefore part of the plan. You know, it was planned in hope, not after the event had happened, but from the very beginning, right from the very beginning of creation, before creation was actually begun. The whole process of creation, whether it took millions of years to set the stage or only a few days, was directly related to and designed with the plan of redemption in mind. Your redemption and mine. Every atom was engineered as a direct preparation for the creation of man as a free agent with the power of making a choice between good and evil, between right and wrong, and with the capacity for redemption since it was known beforehand that the choice would be wrongly made. The process of redemption itself was ultimately bound to the nature of the penalty that disobedience would bring. Namely, the experience of dying. Something that we don't like to much think about, but it is the fall resulting in man's dying that holds the key to an understanding of the physical basis of God's plan of redemption, and human death makes redemption possible. All of the research in the world cannot tell us what kind of physical life Adam enjoyed at first that made it possible for him not to die. You know, unless he disobeyed. Adam ceased to be himself when he disobeyed, and he became something essentially different because he no longer had the power to continue his life indefinitely. When I talk about man today, I'm not talking about man as God created him in Adam. Adam sinned, but the original kind of life was not entirely lost to the human race when Adam fell. Because through the unique formation of Eve out of Adam, provision was made in the woman's seed for its continuance and recovery in the person of Jesus Christ. You know, the universe seems to have been designed for this and the earth was prepared specifically as the stage within the theater of the universe upon which this amazing drama of redemption was to unfold, to be worked out. You know, we need to remember that it was only possible for man to be redeemed by a redeemer who became our kinsman redeemer. The redeemer our Redeemer was God Himself taking upon Himself the nature of man as a permanent, permanent 
not temporary, a permanent part of his own personal existence without in any way surrendering his deity. And it was the, uh, I don't know, the nature of man as a, as a, as a body, uh, spirit entity that made this possible. His death for us by being becoming incarnate in human flesh meant that his manhood could suffer death when his human body died and, and could be recovered again when his human body was resurrected. He died as man, even though he continued to live as God. And it was in his capacity as God that he raised himself again as man from the dead. What he raised up again was his human body and what he thereby reconstituted was his manhood. He was perfectly correct when he said that he would raise his body up again in three days, John 2, 19. But Peter was also equally correct when he said that it was God who raised him up, Acts 2, 24. Because he was God. It was the Lord Jehovah who raised up His own human body and reappeared to the disciples as the Lord Jesus whom they had known before. Even Thomas acknowledged Him when he exclaimed, My Lord and my God. No angel could die for man since angels don't experience physical death and no animal can suffice by its dying either. Only God, only God could suffice as Redeemer of man. And therefore God became man and He dwelt among us. And He became man specifically that He might taste death, not for some single solitary individual as a, as a man might do today in giving his life for a friend, but that he might taste death for every man upon whom the Holy Spirit applied that precious blood. That was why he had to be both man and more than, well, more than man, the God-man Jesus Christ. We know now, or, or should know, that the processes of conception and birth and, and hereditary transmission were, were so designed that out of Adam's loins there might arise a second Adam who could be our Redeemer. So the plan, being perfect as it was, you know, any break in this link, uh, in this chain, would, would make the plan unworkable. Being our Creator God, His plan of redemption is His masterpiece. For man to be redeemable, the race must have begun with an Adam whose physiology was precisely that which Scripture reveals it was in Adam. Man did not evolve. He was a special creation. And in order for the Redeemer to escape the necessity of death while remaining truly man, what is revealed in Genesis to have happened is precisely what had to happen to make the plan of redemption work. The creation of Eve out of Adam in order to separate the two seeds. The housing of the woman's seed in a unique way for its preservation and the virgin conception and birth of a sinless and immortal Redeemer and His bodily resurrection without corruption was proof of its success. The existence and the nature of God, the creation of man and God's image, the formation of Eve, the fact and, and nature of the fall, the the entrance of death, both physical and spiritual, the, the, the promise of a Redeemer, the incarnation whereby God became man for man's redemption through the miracle 
of a virgin conception, the sinless life and vicarious death of that Redeemer, His bodily resurrection without corruption, and His promised return. All of these are the elements of our faith, the basis of our blessed hope as children of God. Children of God that He conceived, not through Adam, but through Christ, the second Adam. The Lord Jesus Christ had to come by virgin conception to be a true human being. He had to, to be truly human to redeem fallen man. He had to redeem fallen man in order that you and I might have His kind of eternal life. You and I must have His kind of of eternal life in order to be a truly human being. I think we far too often think of the salvation of the soul as a salvation of the spirit only, but man is not a spirit only. Angels are spirits, but man is man. And he's man by reason of the duality of his constitution as a body-spirit entity. Man is only himself in the unity of his body and his spirit, wherein the body is animated and the spirit can express itself. You and I will live forever. I don't, I don't, I don't, know, I don't care who you are. You're going to live forever in the body that God has created for you. I marvel at the, the created universe, and I wonder if the universe was not made for the world I'm going to suggest that man in his whole constitution is the reason for the whole of creation itself. While we await the redemption of our bodies, Romans chapter 8, verse 23, the human body is as essential to us as is the human spirit. In spite of the effect of the fall upon man's body, his body is still essential to his spirit because it supplies the spirit with its means of expression and action just as the spirit provides the body with its animation and capacity for uh, purposeful activity. By their separation, body and spirit both die and so dies the whole man. But by the redemption of the body and our bodily resurrection, wherein our redemption is made complete, the whole man is reconstituted personally and the purpose for which we were created is finally realized. The whole creation awaits the redemption of our bodies awaits the redemption of man, a redemption made possible because both the cosmos and man himself were prepared for this. I believe that we were designed for it. By his sacrifice of himself, he who was the creator of the universe affected our salvation by temporarily laying aside the glory that he had shared with his father and being made one with us within the framework of space and time, becoming subject to two kinds of death in our place, so that by rebirth of our spirit and by resurrection of our body, we are wholly and completely redeemed. Just as there is to be a, a race of new men in Christ, uh, new in spirit and new in body, so there is to be a new heaven and a new earth. Nothing has been in vain. Nothing was unforeseen. He who promised that He would make a new people out of us who are really no longer people at all, that's First Peter 2.9, God promised that He would make all other things new as well. In Revelation chapter 21. The drama which uh, we are watching unfold 
is not yet completed. The final chapter has not yet been written or not yet been played out. But our Lord will return and He will return as He went into heaven, a perfect man with a perfect human body. A body as glorious in its constitution and, and potential as God originally planned the human body to be and as such becomes the vehicle of a race appointed to have dominion over all other creatures on earth and perhaps even over the universe itself and we will be like Him free from all sin free from all vulnerabilities free from pain and tears free from the confinement or the constraint of time and space and above all free from the devastation of death with our lord we will be part of a new world that is to encompass a new earth not merely a new heaven we shall not all die, for some will be alive at His coming, though millions will have sown their bodies in the earth. But we shall all be changed, transformed, transfigured, beautified in spirit and in body. Christ Jesus as God-man will restore the pristine splendor of the earth that God planned for it. And we, under Him, will finally fulfill with joy and with skills made perfect the establishment of human dominion over all living things. Paradise won't be a, a, a hoped-for place in heaven, but an, an experienced reality on earth. And on the new earth, it will never, ever wear out or destroy or, de or decay and perhaps this uh, wonderful thing that we call the web of nature will be transported in an ever widening circle and in ever diversifying forms until the whole universe is full of the creatures of God's design of the increase of his kingdom there is to be no end We read that in Isaiah. This enormous universe surely cannot have, could not have been created solely as a display of God's power and might. We see only through a glass darkly. Certainly, man is yet to have total dominion over the physical order, and the Son of Man is yet to wear the crown of that dominion. The millennial age is not the end of it all. All this is but the first step towards a fulfilled reality, the glory of which will be breathless to behold, so that in a wonderful sense we can perhaps say to one another, barring the words of a poem from Robert Browning, Grow old along with me, the best is yet to be, the last of life for which the first was made, our times are in his hand. He says, Behold, I make all things new. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life. Revelation 22, 14, which is in the midst of the garden. Meanwhile, as we await our beloved Redeemer. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon you all. This is Steve. We love you. We truly do. Thanks for watching.